Great. Uh, so thank you very much. It's a real pleasure to be here. Uh, the talk that I'm going to give is going to pick up on a number of themes that others here have discussed. And it's motivated by the growing concern that many in the US have echoed, for instance, in uh, some of the statistics David was showing earlier, that many people may not be saving adequately for retirement. And so partly motivated by this concern, the US and many other countries effectively spend large amounts on trying to subsidize saving and increase the amount that people save. So in the US, the Joint Committee on Taxation estimates that we spend about $100 billion a year on subsidies for retirement savings accounts in the form of 401ks and IRAs, et cetera. So naturally, from a policy perspective, and as economists, we're interested in understanding whether these subsidies are, in fact, effective in increasing the total amount that people are saving. Or can we possibly do better with alternative policies? For instance, things like auto enrollment or defaults, which have been uh, discussed in the academic literature and in policy circles. More generally, uh, stepping back from these specific policy questions, uh, the question that I will be discussing here speaks to what models of savings best describe household behavior and what types of models should we be using to guide policy. So there's naturally an extensive uh, empirical literature studying the impacts of subsidies for retirement saving that goes back a long time. But I think most people would agree that the answers remain debated because, in my view, uh, largely traced back to a lack of high quality data on consumption and savings and a lack of suitable research designs that really allow you to identify causal effects. So in order to obtain more precise evidence, here we're going to turn to data from Denmark, which uh, offers exceptional uh, data on savings and wealth because Denmark had a wealth tax uh, at one point. And as a result, they set up an information reporting system where every bank and every financial company reported everyone's assets every year. And so that uh, gives us a sample spanning 1994 to 2009 of 4 million individuals uh, for whom we have 41 million third-party reported observations on savings. So really a very large high-quality data set on savings behavior. We're going to use that data to analyze two types of policies, the impacts of two types of policies using quasi-experimental methods. The first are automatic contributions by the government or by employers to workers' retirement savings accounts. So this is like the default type of policy that I was talking about. And the second are tax subsidies for retirement savings, analogous to 401ks and IRAs in the US. Denmark has a very similar uh, structure to its retirement system. So I'm going to structure the empirical analysis using a very simple stylized life cycle model in which there are two savings accounts, an illiquid retirement account and a liquid taxable savings account. And there are going to be two types of agents that I'd like you to think about. And you'll see how this connects to what we do in the data. There are uh, people who I'm going to call active savers. They behave exactly as you would in a neoclassical model. And passive savers who specifically uh, ignore government policies when they're choosing their level of pension contributions. So they don't pay attention to how much their employer is contributing to their 401k. They don't pay attention to what the marginal subsidy is for contributing to a retirement account. I'm not going to fully specify exactly how these passive savers behave because it's not going to matter for the types of results that I'm going to show you, but that's the critical feature. So let's walk through how automatic contributions and price subsidies affect the savings behavior of active savers and passive savers. So I'm just going to organize the very simple predictions that come out of this framework in this table. So first, let's ask whether automatic contributions raise pension contributions. So for active savers in a neoclassical model, the way you want to think about an automatic contribution is your employer says, I'm going to deduct $1,000 from your paycheck, and I'm going to deposit that in your 401k account. Well, if you were already saving more than $1,000, you should completely undo that change by the employer, right? If you're at an interior, there's no, no reason that should affect your behavior. And so for active savers, that should not raise your pension contributions. And it also should have no impact on your total saving. By total saving, I mean the amount you're saving in your retirement account plus the amount you're saving outside your retirement account. Now, for passive savers, by definition, when your employer saves an extra $1,000 on your behalf, 
you're going to increase your pension contributions by $1,000. So your total pension contributions are going to go up by $1,000 because you're not paying attention to your employer contributions when you're making your own individual contribution. Now, does that translate to an increase in total saving? That's actually uncertain, right? So the prior literature work that David and Bridget Madry and others have done have shown empirical evidence consistent with the existence of passive savers. They've shown that when you have defaults and when you have automatic enrollment, that affects the amount that people contribute to pension accounts. Does that necessarily mean that it's going to increase the total amount that people save? That's unclear, right? So one way to think about this is while behavioral economics is revolutionizing many aspects of our field, it doesn't change the fact that we're still going to have a budget constraint. Uh, and so that money that people are uh, contributing to pensions could either come from less savings in other accounts or it could come from reduced consumption, right? And it's an empirical question which of the two actually gets crowded out when you have greater contributions to pensions. And so that's one of the questions we'll be addressing here. Uh, now, uh, let, let me walk through the same set of uh, issues for the tax subsidy. So does the tax subsidy affect pension contributions and total saving for passive savers? Again, by definition, the answer is no, because they're not paying attention to the change in the government uh, subsidy for 401ks or IRAs. For active savers, we think that if you increase the subsidy for 401k accounts, they're going to contribute more to those 401ks. But again, it's unclear whether you're going to raise total savings or not. And here, the impact is ambiguous because it depends upon the relative magnitude of price and income effects. So it's possible, for instance, that you're optimizing and you just end up shifting money that you would have saved in a bank account into the retirement account rather than increasing the total amount you save. And that issue of substitution versus increases in total saving, it's a critical question for policy and has been, been the focus of much of the prior empirical literature. How much of the increase in retirement savings accounts that we see is new saving as opposed to shifting across accounts? So what we're going to do in this paper is first ask in the data, what do we see empirically is the answer to each of these four questions. So we'll test the four predictions. And then uh, where I'm headed is trying to estimate the fraction of active versus passive savers. So if you think of there as being these two types in the data, uh, what fraction of the people are behaving as we predict under the neoclassical model and what fraction look like passive savers. Finally, in the last part of the talk, I'll talk briefly about heterogeneity in response across different types of people and show you why we think this active versus passive choice mechanism is really important in understanding savings behavior. So let me start by jumping right in and showing you the impacts of automatic contributions and how we analyze that in our data. So the approach we're going to take, uh, our research design, is going to be to look at people who switch across firms. So to take a concrete example, suppose uh, I were to move from Harvard to Princeton, and let's say Princeton has a different uh, savings plan, a uh, different uh, contribution to its uh, uh, retirement, to, to people's retirement savings accounts relative to Harvard. Does that have an impact on the amount that I'm saving? So th that's what this figure is doing. So what we're doing uh, to construct this figure is take a set of people who switch firms at time zero. This is an event study looking at savings behavior around that time. So year zero is the year you switch firms. Year minus one is the year before. Year plus one is the year after, et cetera. And we're focusing on the subset of people who switch to a firm that's contributing 3% more to the retirement account than the prior employer, right? So the green line here shows you the change. It plots uh, employer pension contributions relative to event time. And this is, first of all, mechanically, because we've selected people who are switching to firms with larger pension contributions, you see a jump in that green line at time zero as people are switching to these firms that contribute more to retirement accounts on their behalf. Now, remember that the prediction of the neoclassical model is that people will fully offset to the extent they can this increase in the green line by cutting back their own individual pension contributions. And the way it works in Denmark is all of these uh, um, investments are in the same types of accounts, so these are really perfect substitutes for each other. Now, notice that individual pension contributions, the red line being plotted here, do in fact fall 
So qualitatively, it's correct that you do see offset when employers contribute more, but the drop in the red line is much, much smaller than the jump in the green line. So you're very far from full offset within the retirement accounts. Moreover, and this is the most important result and what you can do with the Danish data because you see the full portfolio, this is plotting the amount that you're saving in taxable accounts. So non-retirement accounts like your bank accounts, brokerage accounts, and so forth. This is almost entirely flat around the point that you're switching to the employer that's contributing a lot more to your retirement account. So what's the net consequence of the three things that I showed you? If you add up those three curves, it shows that if you switch to a firm that's contributing more to your retirement account, your total savings rate jumps significantly. That is contrary to the predictions of the neoclassical model. Your savings rate is highly dependent upon these, your total savings is highly dependent upon these automatic contributions. Now, one natural concern with uh, this research design is that maybe other things are changing at the same time, right? So when you're moving to this firm that's saving more on your behalf, maybe your tastes are changing at the same time, your income's going up, and so maybe that's why you wanted to save more for other reasons. So one piece of evidence that to me strongly speaks against that is that what's really driving this pattern is that the vast majority of people are doing nothing to their individual pension contributions when they switch firms. So in other words, if I switch to a firm that's contributing 3.4% more of my income uh, relative to the last firm, for a lot of people, their pension contribution rates, their total savings go up by exactly 3.4%. So unless people happen to sort to firms in a way that they exactly match the actual change in pension contributions with what they wanted to save, which seems quite unlikely, it rather looks like people are somewhat inattentive and just happen to go with whatever ends up happening uh, as their firm's default. Okay, so based on that evidence and a lot more evidence that I don't have time to discuss here, we conclude that approximately 85% of individuals respond passively to changes in automatic contributions, and they primarily cut consumption to meet the budget when their disposable income falls. So if I uh, cut your disposable income by a dollar and I put that in a retirement account for you, uh, that seems to reduce the amount you consume and thereby increase the total amount you save. I should also emphasize that we, we find that those savings increases persist for several years, even after there are large changes in your employer contribution rates. So this is not just like tiny changes that end up being undone uh, after a couple of years. That, you know, in my view, seems to challenge simple banded rationality models where it's just small costs of adjustment that are preventing people from undoing this. So the bottom line from a policy point of view is that we find that cutting person salary by a dollar and raising pension contributions by a dollar would increase savings rates by at least 80 cents. Okay, so that's our assessment of automatic contributions. Let me now turn to an assessment of the impact of tax subsidy, subsidies. So here the research design we're gonna use is a different uh, quasi experiment, one that uh, involved a policy change by the Danish government where in 1999, for people in the top income tax bracket, which in Denmark is at 250,000 kroner, which is approximately 40,000 US dollars, at which point the income tax rate becomes in the range of 60, 65%, um, the subsidy for saving and retirement accounts was cut by 12 percentage points. So essentially you received a larger subsidy if you were to the right of that 250,000 line in 1998 than the people to the left, and after 1999, the subsidy was constant at about 18 percentage points across the board. So let me now plot pension contributions versus income. So the way this figure is constructed is uh, we bin the x-axis into 5,000 kroner bins, and we're plotting the mean pension contribution within each of those bins so that you can see non-parametrically the relationship between pension contributions and income. This curve here is drawn for 1996 uh, before the subsidy was, was reduced. This is what it looks like in 1997, 1998. You can see that that pattern looks relatively stable. Higher income people are saving more as you'd expect. 1999, the uh, subsidy is reduced for people in the top income tax bracket. And you can see that immediately the amount that these people are contributing to pensions falls sharply, the people in the top bracket, whereas there's essentially no change for people in the lower bracket. 
Same thing in 2000, same thing in 2001. We stay stable at this lower level of pension contributions for people in the treatment group on the right side relative to people in the control group on the left side. So at face value, if you look at that figure, it seems like it's inconsistent with the view that uh, a lot of people are passive savers, right? Because here we're seeing a big response to the subsidy change, whereas before I was showing you that employers can change the amount they contribute, and we also have evidence that governments change their, their mandatory savings contributions, and that doesn't seem to lead to much of a response. So what's going on? Well, it turns out that if you dig deeper and look at the heterogeneity of this response, it's driven by a very small fraction of people. So this chart here plots the percentage change in pension contributions from one year to the next. So the blue series here shows you uh, the percentage change in pension contributions from 1997 to 1998, the year before this reform. And you can see that a large mass of people don't make any change in pension contributions at all. Some subset of people completely drop out. That's the spike at the bottom. And then there's some diffuse mass elsewhere. So what happens in the year of the reform? In the year of the reform, that mass of people who don't do anything falls discreetly, and then a large chunk of people completely stop contributing to pensions. And in fact, if you tally up the numbers, the 19% of people who completely exit uh, the, uh, con completely stop contributing to the pension account, they entirely account for the aggregate response that I was showing you before. So in that sense, it's again consistent with the view that something like 80, 85% of people are passive savers, and a small chunk of people, like 20% or so, are active savers who are actually responding to these policies. So the next question I, I want to address is, you know, we see that the tax subsidies induce about 20% of individuals to save more in retirement accounts. So from that perspective, it looks like the subsidies are at least effective in getting some people to save more. But before we can draw that conclusion, we have to ask, where does that money come from, right? Does it come from them actually reducing consumption, which, you know, as Bob was saying, consumption is really the choice variable here. That's what matters. In order to raise savings, you've got to reduce consumption, right? Or are they just saving less in non-retirement accounts? So let me show you how we tackle that question. So coming back to this uh, impact on pension contributions here, you see that the nature of the treatment effect is that the marginal propensity to save <laughs> is falling for people on the right side of that uh, cut off relative to the people on the left. So before the reform, uh, there was a, you know, the marginal propensity to save in these retirement accounts remained positive as your income was going up. After the reform, the marginal propensity to save as your income is going up is positive here, but then is quite a bit lower to the right side. So another way that you can see that in the time series is just plot the marginal propensity to save for people above the top tax cutoff minus the people, uh, the marginal propensity to save for people below the top tax cutoff, the difference in the marginal propensities to save for the people above and below the cutoff here, plot that over time. And what you see is that the marginal propensity to save in retirement accounts is falling in 1999 differentially for people in the treated group right when the subsidy is reduced. So this is just a way of restating the result that I was showing you before. Now let's plot the marginal propensity to save in non-retirement accounts. You see that it looks essentially like a mirror image. When the marginal propensity to save in the retirement accounts is falling, the marginal propensity to save in the non-retirement accounts is rising. So that extra dollar that I earn, when the subsidy is lower, I put less of it in the retirement account, but I'm putting more of it in the non-retirement account. And so what that shows you is that there's a lot of substitution between these two different types of accounts. And so building on this type of logic, we conclude that more than 95% of the extra saving in the retirement accounts induced by a subsidy change is actually coming from less saving in non-retirement accounts. And as a result, if you do sort of a bang for the buck calculation, we conclude that each dollar of expenditure on tax subsidies raises total personal saving by less than one cent. That's the point estimate the upper bound of the 95% confidence interval is something like 15 cents. Okay, so the last uh, set of results I wanna show you is thinking about uh, this active versus passive choice mechanism and trying to understand why the subsidies seem to have such different effects than the automatic contributions. Are the differences between the impacts of automatic contributions and subsidies driven by active versus passive choice or something else? 
So to get at that, we're going to test the mechanism by analyzing the heterogeneity of responses across individuals. So the way I think about this is ideally what I'd like to do is if, if there were labels in the data for this person's an active saver and this person's a passive saver, I'd like to see if we see different responses for, to the subsidy. Do we see greater response to the subsidy among the active savers and less response among the passive savers and likewise for the employer uh, pension contribution changes? So obviously we don't directly observe in the data who's active and who's passive, but we try to construct some sensible proxies for things that we think might be correlated with attention to retirement saving and activeness. So the first most obvious proxy, I think, is the portfolio rebalancing rate. How often do people make adjustments to their pension contributions and their portfolios in other years? It's a very simple direct measure of how active you are in uh, up your savings behavior. A second measure is just your level of wealth. So David uh, has a paper, a, a theoretical paper where they show that um, people with lower discount rates uh, or essentially people who procrastinate less, they're more likely to uh, overcome the small costs of optimization that are required to re-optimize their, their portfolios. And so they're more likely to be active savers. But naturally, if you have lower discount rates and you're less likely to procrastinate, you're also going to end up saving more. So you get this prediction from that type of setup and it's also, I think, more generally intuitive that people who are saving more for retirement and have accumulated more wealth, they are more likely to be active savers who are going to be paying attention to these policies. And then a third natural proxy from like a labor economics point of view is maybe something about education uh, matters. So by all three of these measures, we find that more attentive individuals respond more to the subsidy change in 1999, that is, they're more likely to shift assets across accounts when the subsidy is reduced. And they're also more likely to offset changes in automatic contributions. So in both dimensions, they behave more like neoclassical agents. So let me show you one example of that result. So here on the y-axis is the fraction of people who stopped contributing to pensions in 1999 after the subsidy was reduced. So remember, I was telling you before that that's the key nature of this response. It's an extensive margin response where people just stop contributing. On the x-axis is the person's wealth income ratio in 1998. And what you can see is that uh, we've binned this into 20 equal sized bins. People who have higher levels of wealth are significantly more likely to stop contributing uh, to pensions when the subsidy is reduced, consistent with the view that these guys on the right side, they're the active types, they're paying more attention to the subsidy and and getting out of the pensions when the subsidy is reduced. And I think most strikingly, conversely, they're also on the y-axis here now, same x-axis, the y-axis is the extent to which uh, a $1 increase in employer pension contributions is passed through to your total savings. And that number is lower for higher wealth people. So again, the more active guys are more likely to offset you know, if Princeton increases its employer contribution by $1,000, they're more likely to offset that by cutting their own savings by $1,000. Again, very consistent with this view that uh, active choice matters. I'm just take two more minutes if that's okay. So w one more form of heterogeneity uh, on the line of education, which is kind of interesting. So again, look at this measure of percent who stopped contributing to pensions in 1999. So you see that people who have a college degree are more likely to respond than people who don't. Where you really get your bang for the buck is the people who took an economics class, consistent with some work I think that Anna Lissardi will talk about in a little bit. Um, OK, so let me wrap up by talking about the implications for um, macro models of consumption and some of what I see as the implications for policy. So the first point here is that you see that the marginal propensity to consume differs sharply by the form of compensation. So if I give you a dollar in the form of a pension contribution, rather than in the form of, a, of disposable income, of salary, you're much more likely to save it if it's in the form of a pension contribution. And so that suggests that something like inattention or passivity matters independent of the factors we've been talking about, like Chris's work on liquidity constraints and so forth. There are other elements that also matter as well in thinking about why we see excess sensitivity. Second, the data point is something like a spender savers model where they're heterogeneous agents. 85% of individuals are spenders with sort of a cash on hand rule of thumb. 
And third, this comes to actually uh, one of the points Bob was making. This is Bob's sigma parameter. Here, our results suggest that the interest elasticity of savings is low, that a sigma is low, for two reasons. First, many people react passively to changes in the net of tax return. Lots of people, they're just not even paying attention when you're effectively changing the net of tax return by changing tax rates. Moreover, even the guys who do reoptimize, the active savers, they appear to have a low interest elasticity of saving because they're mainly just substituting across accounts rather than actually changing consumption. Last slide, let me talk about implications for tax policy. Our uh, conclusion from this is that tax subsidies are ineffective at raising savings for three reasons. You spend money subsidizing the savings of a large mass of people who are passive savers who don't respond at all to the subsidy change. Second, even among the 15% of people who do respond to the subsidy change, most of that is shifting rather than an increase in saving. And third, you're sort of targeting the wrong guys. The guys who you're trying to encourage to save more are the passive savers who aren't responding to the subsidy to begin with, and the active savers are already saving, so you're kind of mistargeting with this policy. Automatic contributions resolve all three of those problems. And so one of the, you know, our view is that automatic contributions are a potentially useful tool. One of my co-authors, John Friedman, is currently working at the National Economic Council. And you might have heard um, President Obama and the State of the Union discussing some proposals to reconsider the way savings policies are structured in the US, what they're calling my IRA accounts coupled with caps on tax deductions for saving, which would be consistent with the results we're showing here. Thank you. Thank you very much. <clears throat> So for something like auto automatic contributions or default options, I often wonder in the US context whether the marginal savings in the pension plan are being financed passively through borrowing. So people going out and unthinkingly uh, spending a bit more on their credit cards to keep their uh, current discretionary consumption on change. Do you have any ability to uh, look at borrowing in your data and what sort of external validity does the Danish consumer credit market have for other consumer credit markets that we might be interested in? So the first question is easy for me to answer because we have data on debt for everyone and the measures I was showing you, some of them are net savings measures and we don't find impacts on, on debt, in fact. So within Denmark, we're fairly confident empirically that that's not uh, a major concern in terms of running up credit card debt or something like that. We don't see that much of that response. Whether that would generalize to the US or not, it's much harder for me to say, right? So a lot of the natural questions as this has been translated to the US policy debate relate to whether Denmark, lessons from Denmark can be translated to the US or not. I think to the, you know, insofar as the key mechanism here is about attention and a lot of the findings within retirement accounts have been replicated in the US, so for instance, the importance of defaults or uh, the fact that subsidies have certain impacts within retirement accounts. We find pretty similar patterns in Denmark and the US. Um, they suggest that the findings would translate, but something like, would you find different impacts on credit cards? It's, it's hard for me to say. I actually wanted to continue a bit on this question, which is, are there possibility to borrow against those accounts? And so this can tell us a little bit about, for example, leakage instead in the US account, because in the US you can borrow and we see a lot of leakage, for example, so that could be an important thing. The second thing I wanted to see whether you could elaborate more on this heterogeneity. Because w when you say you know, 85 and the 15, of course, it's an important form of, of heterogeneity. But once we look at the saving behavior, we see an enormous amount of heterogeneity in the data. Right? So the automatic enrollment, which is great, I think is still too crude an instrument in the way we do it. Right? Like one rate for everybody. And you know, we, we let them save a little more, but you know, people are different. They are young. You know, some of them have to buy a house. You know, some of them might not be able to borrow. So you know, increasing saving only might not be the only objective. And I wonder whether we can do more to actually really account for that heterogeneity we clearly see in the data. Yeah, so I, I absolutely agree. So you, know, you can't necessarily take these findings normatively as saying, we want to have policies that increase everyone's savings rates by 
5%. There's a lot of heterogeneity out there, especially people in certain parts of the life cycle or they want to you know, maybe be paying for their kids' college education, or something like that. There are good reasons they might not want to save more. So I certainly um, am not suggesting that we just want to take this and say, clearly, we want to default people into saving more simply because we have that instrument. I think what we're saying is this is a key dimension of heterogeneity, that there are a whole bunch of people who behave in this passive way and then 15% or 20% of people who don't. And so that's one important dimension of heterogeneity to keep in mind when setting these policies. But I certainly agree you'd want to tailor it in, uh, in finer ways. And can you just remind me on the first question again? Yes. So on the leakage and uh, the, you, so to my knowledge, you cannot borrow against the accounts in Denmark. And moreover, this actually relates to a point David was making, the penalty in Denmark is 60%. And so the leakage rate, we've looked at the rate of withdrawals, we have data on the rate of withdrawals, it's extremely low in Denmark relative to the US. And so then one of the things we do is look at balances in retirement accounts, total wealth in retirement. And we're able to show that these defaults not only affect the amount that you're saving every year, but we see m more total wealth when you retire, precisely because there isn't that much uh, leakage. So that seems like an important issue. I guess I'm a bit interested in these guys who switch jobs, because if they're passive, then it looks like when they go to this new job that has a higher contribution rate, it seems like it would look to them like they're getting paid less. I mean, they would get sort of this after, you know, they get this after savings thing, they consume less, so it looks like they're going to a worse paying job. And I guess I'm wondering if you have these guys who are sort of selected on going to a less paying job from their sort of passive perspective, is it equally plausible that they want to save more? Of course, it's not 3.14%, it's yeah, like yeah. two and a half versus three and a half. Let me, let me clarify, so you're absolutely right. There are multiple things that when you switch jobs, and you know, this is just because I, didn't have enough time to go through this in, in full detail. Uh, so when you switch jobs, your income is changing and your pension contributions are changing. And so really what we do is look at both of those effects. So we're saying, imagine if I showed you an event study similarly for income changes. When your income changes by a dollar, your savings only go up by 10 cents. And in that figure, I was, think of it as essentially holding your income fixed. When the pension contribution goes up by a dollar, savings goes up by 90 cents. And so if you imagine estimating a regression with both of those things changing, I'm able to get the impact of the change in the automatic contribution holding income fixed and vice versa. And that's the number that I'm saying is 80 cents. So it's not that every person who's switching to the higher pension contribution is switching to a job with lower income. You've got both of these changes. You can estimate both of the effects and then calculate the net effect. That's really where I was getting. After contribution income, not before contribution income. After con yeah. Exactly. I just, want, I just wanted to make sure I understood the, yeah. the, the design. So in the second experiment, the tax subsidy, you actually can't, in terms of the treatment effect, you can't actually see how the lower income people respond. Just in terms so of the it's design. local to, yes, it's yeah. local to 75% so, so you're basically using the, the first experiment to basically say, look, these guys are like, likely wouldn't have responded anyway because the first experiment we show no one responds. Is that, so that's the kind of logic. No, 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 sorry, no. So, so in the tax subsidy experiment, only the people above the 75th percentile of the income distribution right. are experiencing a change. I agree. The people below are a pure control group. Nothing changed for them. Right, but you're in, these, in this last slide, though, you're kind of asserting that the guys who are below that threshold would not have responded to the tax subsidy in the same way that the people... So you're basically <clears throat> making a point about a local average treatment. Yeah, effect, I just right? want to make the, sure that, that... Elasticity yeah. could potentially be higher, possibly, for people in other parts of the But it's likely not to be because of the first experiment. I think yeah, that's my, the way... my instinct is... You're right. I mean, our estimate is local to, to that change, but that's correct. So should I be concerned a little bit that you're measuring this reaction to a loss of a subsidy and assuming that the reaction to a gain of a subsidy would just be a mirror image? Um, so it may very well be, but then you know people react to gains and losses differently, so I don't know. Uh, is it possible to see in your data uh, people who you know just jump over that 250,000 kroner threshold uh, through a you know, promotion, change of jobs, whatever, 
and see how they change their savings before tax change and then how they change their savings after the tax change. So, you could so, so that you, yeah. you can see the effect of yeah. the really increase in the marginal Good tax. Idea. Yeah, yeah, that's a great idea. We've, so you could kind of implicitly see that I didn't directly show you panel evidence like that and I think it would be interesting to explore that further directly. But the way I was describing it with the marginal propensities to save, so if you look, think back to those figures I was showing you, there was a clear increase in the slope uh, prior to the point where the subsidy changed when you cross to the right of the cutoff. So if you imagine a person moving along that line as they're getting promoted, that is basically saying that the amount they're saving these accounts is going up when they cross into the top tax bracket exactly along your lines. And that effect disappears once the subsidy is removed. So the fact that there is a increase in the slope in the marginal propensity to save before the reform is consistent with the view that the subsidy, increasing the subsidy would increase savings exactly along your logic. Uh, those that would hit a kind of a zero savings yeah. and eliminate them from the uh, analysis. Yep. So that's another issue I, I kind of glossed over here, but you're absolutely right. That's, that's critical. You can only undo these savings changes if you're at the interior, right? And so if you hit the zero bound, then you're not, uh, not going to be able to offset it. So what we do is two things. We either condition on people who are in the interior in the previous period to make sure to reduce, you know, limit the number of people who are actually going to hit that constraint. But the other approach, which is actually my preferred approach, is to use a threshold. So let's say I measure the fraction of people who are saving more than $5,000. Then if I have a $1,000 increase in the subsidy, that should have no impact on the fraction of people saving more than $5,000 because that's completely in the interior. And you see an effect there, which shows that it can't be driven by the corners. So I was impressed by what seems in Denmark to be a far more aggressive tax rate uh, in the calculations, my goodness. And so when we think about applying your study to uh, the United States, uh, two factors come to mind. Uh, how much of a confounding factor do you think in your mind is the difference of uh, progressivity in the tax rates between the United States, uh, between Denmark and the United States? My view is the fundamental mechanism we're identifying here is about heterogeneity and active versus passive choice and attention and the way in which people are adjusting their budget when automatic contributions are changed. As a first pass, I don't see exactly why the progressivity of the income tax system would affect that particular mechanism. So my instinct is it would translate over to an economy with a less uh, progressive tax system insofar as we see similar patterns in terms of attention and heterogeneity and attention within retirement accounts in the US data. So basically to be clear, the key advantage of the Danish data is that you get to see everyone's full portfolio, not just the amount they have in retirement accounts, but also in non-retirement accounts, unsecured debt, et cetera. In the US data, you have pretty good information on <coughs> retirement accounts from specific brokerages and things like that. So what I've been saying a few times is that within the retirement accounts where you have data in both countries, behavior looks relatively similar. So that makes me think that the fact, you know, that would suggest that behavior would also be similar outside. So is, is the difference in the welfare state of Denmark uh, for a potential to retiree who might receive more benefits otherwise that do not need to be provided for by retirement savings be a factor? Yeah, so that, the, you know, that's also possible. Again it, again, it doesn't, to me, directly say that the attention mechanism would be different, but the amount that people save is naturally going to be different in Denmark where there are more Social Security benefits than the U.S., just the levels of saving. That's certainly true. Question. In the U.S., when people are defaulted in to a contribution rate, as you know, they stick originally, but over time, they kind of come off of that default contribution rate and eventually make an adjustment. So there is a kind of activity that ends up coming slowly. Mm -hmm. 
and they need to do that because the default contribution rate in the U.S. is woefully inadequate. Is it the case in Denmark that the default contributions are essentially adequate so that passivity is, in some sense, more optimal in Denmark than it is in the U.S.? So the Danish system has a lot of heterogeneity across firms. So there's a, there was temporarily a 1% government mandate, relatively minor. But as you were seeing from some of those charts I was showing, there's a great deal of heterogeneity across firms in terms of the amount they're contributing to these retirement accounts. So it's, it would be hard to argue that across that entire range, it's adequate unless you have some dramatic sorting of workers to to firms, right? So, I mean, there's going to be some region of people where you could say, yeah, you know, they're roughly around the optimum, and so it makes sense for them to be passive. But then if that's true, there's another set of people who are 7 or 10 percentage points away for whom it, it can't by, by definition. So I think the fact that you see very similar patterns across the distribution makes me think that it's not just about being close to the optimum. That's why you're, you're passive. And one way to kind of quantify that is to ask, in the U.S., the median worker has, if they were totally passive, would have a replacement rate of 60%, 50%, something like that, um, including Social Security and all the other aspects of the system. What would, a, what would the median totally passive Danish worker experience? Yeah, that's a great question. I don't know the answer off the top of my head. It's going to vary a lot depending upon where that worker happens to work, which firm they're they're in, but uh, that's something we can look into. That's a good idea. Okay, thank you. Thanks very much.